Companions are the future of video gaming. Now that might sound a bit of a grand future for the silly little half-formed pixelated liabilities that try and frequently fail to follow you around as you adventure through the game world, famous for their near unequaled ability to get stuck on random rocks and trees as their Stone Age AI struggles with the intricacies of bumpy terrain. And yet, for all the self-evident technical difficulties, for all the obvious immediate shortcomings and flaws, companion characters, even in their currently undoubtedly so limited form, are remarkably popular. Let me show you something here. This is the Nexus Mods page for Skyrim. That's a famous rat slaying simulator that's been released on more platforms than the original Doom, and that has been released on Notepad, or at least it runs on it. Love it or hate it, Skyrim is the biggest thing in the RPG world, and a big reason for that is its thriving mod scene where companion mods have 6,836 mods listed at the times of writing this video. That is the single biggest mod category of them all, with armor, models and textures and weapons all losing out to an army of big-titted anime waifus. <laughs> or, well, actually, see, that is really a very reductivist position of me to take. For whilst, yes, a huge portion are indeed very Japanese-inspired and simple followers that do little more than shoot, swing, die, and look pretty whilst doing so, there are also a handful of genuinely impressive gems. For example, I rarely let the opportunity pass me by to shill the Inigo mod which is probably the currently closest thing to my vision of what a proper companion character should be that is currently on the market. Fully voiced and lavishly scripted, Inigo and others like Sophia have tons of commentary on the game world, on lore, on enemies, on locations, even on events happening like finding a trap or killing a bandit, etc. They are very competently made mods, even more impressively so as they are usually created by one or two guys and a voice actor. And these mods do add enormously so to the gameplay experience. But we don't even need to go to the best in field to see the value of a companion character, as even in their currently most limited form, like the base Skyrim game companion followers, which are little more than dead doll NPCs that follow you around, there are full guides written on how to relocate these followers when they inevitably derp out, or how to marry them, and obviously mods are plenty to make them look better. Already this tells us that the players are developing some sort of a relationship with these soulless, dead-eyed bundles of buggy code, and that there is some form of emotional investment going on. I remember an article from PC Gamer about Skyrim. I know, hard to believe that it ever actually covered gaming news, but, well, <laughs> the good old days and all that, where the author was writing about how strangely attached he had grown to Lydia one of the basic in-game companion characters that were available in Skyrim from launch. And these were very much so an afterthought. They are not very well made. Lydia has like four voice lines, half of which are or I'm gonna kill you. And beyond commands like follow me, stay there, or attack that, there's not really a whole lot you can do with her. Mechanically speaking, she is ridiculously limited, and she doesn't have a whole lot of personality either, frankly. Yet, despite all of that, despite how unbelievably basic she was, to the point of being little more than a dead-eyed doll that follows you around and occasionally reduces the enemy hit point pools, or occasionally reduces yours by running into a room full of traps, 
she had somehow become a very endearing entity to this author. And when he eventually lost track of her because the AI was that goddamn basic and poorly thought through, he went on a massive quest to find her only to eventually discover her dead. And he felt genuinely sad about it and decided to create a little grave memorial to her in-game, hauling her ass through the shitty physics to a point that he figured would be nice for her. And again, Lydia was basic beyond belief, and so were many of the other companion characters that never resonated with players to the same degree. So the question is, what made Lydia so different? Well, it is all because of one single line that transformed her from that boring, dead-eyed fish creature thing that swings a sword occasionally by your side to a character that the player could anthropomorphize. You see, you can ask the companion characters to carry some of your stuff. And when you do that to Lydia, she says, whilst clearly sighing under her breath, I am sworn to carry your burdens. And you just try telling me that that doesn't bring a little smile to your face. It is... It, it is a point of unexpected humor that makes her instantly likable and transformed at least one person's entire gameplay experience. But let's try and break this down a little bit further, because maybe this is simply a fluke. Maybe the author was simply just playing it up for the gallery, potentially. And yet, why am I so insistent that companions are the future? Well, let me lay out my theses here for you. Firstly, because companions simply haven't been done before. Oh, sure, we have things like uh, like Lydia, of course, dumb and deaf doors that blindly follow you around, and we have um, in-game romance routes like uh, Judy from Cyberpunk, which, by the way, was very well done until it just kind of, you know, ended out of nowhere. And we even have full-blown relationships and families, like with uh, Ciri in The Watcher and the various romance interests of Geralt, of course. But once more, you can broadly divide these into two types. The cutscene relationship, where smartly scripted conversations bond you to a character, or dumb doll sections, where they follow you around, getting stuck on geometry and occasionally missing enemies with ranged weapons. In some cases, you even have a, a sort of mix between the two, like in Mass Effect, for example, with Miranda. But a true companion character can be so much more than this, because those characters are in essence nothing more than a storytelling tool. They are part of the, the background, pretty much, just rolling past as you go through the story. A real companion character is not just a part of the story, they are in the story. On the same level as you, the player. They can experience it alongside you, whilst also giving you insight, commentary and lore. They can be a person whose very presence transforms that story, which is the absolute key for the future of gaming. Because frankly, at this point, we have already done everything. We have fought dragons, we have fought demons, we have fought aliens, we have been the demons, we have been the aliens. We have saved the world from Nazis, and Soviets, and terrorists, and stormed the beaches of Normandy two dozen times over. We have been to the deepest ocean, the furthest planets, and the darkest reaches of space. Hell, we have been to the deepest ocean on alien planets. Every story, every location, every vista has been visited and revisited 18 times. It is also common now, so draw. To the veteran gamer, even the most magnificent alien sunset, seen from atop a speeding asteroid, it's nothing more than a clutter of volumetric lighting, really. Maybe some particle effects if they're feeling extra spicy. A brief and decidedly artificial interlude between bursts of shooty-shooty bang-bang and nothing more. 
gaming needs something new. And to experience all of those things alongside someone or something more correctly might just be it. Now, it has to be done well. Because nothing is worse than lugging around a useless deadweight companion that forces you to slow walk whilst it expositions at you. You do not want a game long escort quest. And in most of the cases where this has kind of pseudo been attempted before, like for example in Resident Evil 4, that is of course exactly what it became. It seems a very difficult thing to do, therefore, to get this right, but fortunately for us, the human brain is actually pretty easy to trick in this regard, because it is pretty much hardwired to anthropomorphize damn near everything we see. And as an example of this uh, trickery I'm talking about here, for example, this little story here of the Mars Rover. It is just a machine, it has no emotions, it does not think, and it does not care. But you can't help but read this and feel just a little bit bad for it. Just like if I were to expand it a little bit, you'd suddenly feel a little bit happier again too. And this is the trick to humanize the thing. Let's go back to that uh, sunset scene again, for example. You look at it for a second, think, well, oh, that's a neat light effect, I guess, and then run on. But the companion stops and goes, wow, or whatever, and acts super impressed, as you would be normally seeing something like that. Maybe that is enough to get you interested and turn back and look at it again whilst the companion is all giddy. Or maybe you can't be fucked and you just move on, expecting the stupid bot to continue its conversation and then teleport to catch up to you later. Which is where you play a little ploy. The companion interrupts its reverie and goes, hey, wait, and if you don't wait, they'll sigh and run after you to catch up whilst lamenting that they couldn't stay to see it. Making you feel bad. It's a very simple trick, but it makes the character far more human, because it responded to the environment and to your reaction to that environment. Which in turn also subverts a player's expectations of a bot follower. And this of course can and should be extended to other areas. Every opportunity to do something dynamic should be seized. Little what I like to call surprise lines. Like, say you are in a major city, and there is a famous building. The companion has already told you about this building, doing its job as a storyteller and informer, a bit of a guide in a way. And of course, returning to that area and seeing that building again, the player will naturally expect the AI to either be silent because it doesn't have a script to play anymore, the trigger has already been set off, or for it to simply rattle off the exact same script that it did last time. This is what we've been uh, completely accustomed to the AI doing, and so you use that. You begin playing the conversation again, just like you did the first time. But in the middle, have the companion go, oh, wait, I've already told you this, didn't I? And then just shut up. <laughs> I guarantee you that would at the very least get a bit of a, oh, that's kind of neat moment out of the plan. You could also have the companion comment on time spent to make them seem like they're paying attention. It's been X day since we were here last. Or actions taken. Uh, we have a house here. Or remember that dungeon so and so far from here with the bandits in it. These little things add life to a character and ease the human brain's task of anthropomorphizing that character. Um, yet another opportunity is, for example, when the companion is downed in combat. First time the companion, assuming a seasoned adventurer, when you go over to resurrect them, you expect them to go like, oh, thank you, or play one or two voice lines. Okay, do that. But take the character in mind. Have them sheepishly apologize. The line lines of, oh, I, I didn't see that one, ha ha ha. 
whatever you were fighting at the time, didn't see that goblin or wolf or whatever. Next time, in the same dungeon, the companion goes down, they begin to start sounding a little annoyed at it. Like, god damn it, oh, I didn't see that one either. You know, getting a bit angry about it. If they go down again, maybe they'll even lash out at the player, like swatting away their hand and getting up on their own. You know, grumbling about it. And then later out there, later in the day, going like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I lashed out at you. I got really annoyed with that. And all of this is done in order to make the player lower their guard. And again, to help the anthropomorphizing process, to make them look at the companion as not just a bot. And then it's all you need to achieve, too. You don't need to make them think it's a human. You're obviously not going to achieve that. It is just a bot. Its AI is still going to be rather limited. But so long as you can introduce the element of doubt, the human brain will take over the rest. And thus, the real work can begin. As the main role of a good companion is not just to be an extra sword arm in a fight. It is to enhance the story, the world, and all of the locations, both to make the player's life easier and to make it simpler for them to immerse themselves into the world too. Let's um, take a fantasy style setting, shall we? You know, a la Skyrim, the big one. Think of all the, the dinky ass caves and grottos you cleaned out of savages and bandits and goblins and all manners of near do wells in that game, and never thought twice about it. Most of those locations actually did have a story. If only something basic like how it came to be occupied by whatever loot bag NPCs lived there. Even if it is something so thoroughly basic as a bunch of mining tools scattered haphazardly after they chased off the miners, or after some goblins emerged, etc, etc. But unless you're already very immersed in the story, in the setting, and in the adventure, you're unlikely to actually think a whole lot about this. And you're unlikely to really engage fully with the world and the story that it's trying to tell you. For example, let us say that um, a cave has been infested with bandits. So obviously this would probably have become a rumor in the nearby village. A rumor about the unsavory lot that lives in so-and-so cave. Make a mechanic out of that. When you arrive in a village, the companion can be asked to go listen for rumours, and then come trotting back with relevant quest hooks and information. Then, whilst out on the quest, the companion could dole out the research. The cave was originally a mine. It was made 20 years ago, but then ran dry some 5 years ago. It was abandoned a year later, after no further seams could be discovered. And it was expected to be just abandoned forever, until one day the bandits decided to break break in, and now they've been causing all kinds of trouble, robbing travellers and merchants and so on and so on. The local village is very upset about this, and the local lord might be offering a reward for anyone who can deal with it. Now, of course, you don't need to go quite that far in making a whole mechanic out of it, but again, the main role of the companion is to make the story better, and so they should have a lot of information on the world. People, costumes, locations, and rumours. Even something again as simple as the companion pointing out all of the discarded mining tools and going, huh. I guess this must have been a mine at some point, would already add an additional layer to that cave adventure. There is also tons of other relevant information that can build up a world and the characters in it. There is an excellent little um, touch in the game Sacrifice, one of the best games ever made incidentally, where Zizix, your imp friend, tells you that Ambassador Booter is trying to marry the sorceress Scorcher, who has rebuked his every advance and Zizix wonders if this is where she got her talent for defensive warfare from. It's an exchange of uh, no more than three, maybe four lines or so, a throwaway bit of dialogue never brought up again, and you could even miss it entirely. You maybe exchange like two sentences with either of those other two characters mentioned through the whole game, and still I remember this bit of information to this day. 
It is a bit of added depth to the world, which I can recall precisely because of how irrelevant it is. It was just a bit of trivia given casually in a random conversation with a flying imp things with wings on its head that I liked because he had already provided useful information in the past. Which is another little sly ploy as well. We tend to like things that help us, so the companions should be able to do just that. By um, spotting traps, for example. Or sometimes not spotting the traps, and then a little embarrassed go, whoops, after <laughs> you've already stepped on it. Uh, which leads me to another fan favorite example of this, which would be Half Life's Alex. In the first game, she gives you the Lord of Ravenholm, and then preps the player for the experience by telling them the haunting tale of its demise, getting them in the mood for a mild horror shift from Half Life's uh, Shooty Shooty Bang Bang. In the sequel, she accompanies the player for a while and does useful things like sending down ladders and acting as a guide. She became so popular that she eventually got her own game. In VR, granted, so you could also argue that she was a bit of a sacrificial lamb there. And depending on how far one wants to go with this, the possibilities are next to endless. You can integrate things into the game world that only certain companions can do. Maybe a power type barbarian can smash through a door, whilst a thief can pick a lock. Or an acrobat could slink through a crack in the wall to open it from the other side. Or you could even go the full-on Republic Commando route. Another game with great companions in the form of your clone trooper brethren. That game has a system where you can order your squad members to carry out environmental tasks. Point towards a chest-high wall and they will take cover behind it. A gantry and they will set up a sniping position. Or a door and they will stack up on it getting ready to breach the room with explosives and grenades. Now, in my opinion, the deeper you integrate the companions into the experience, the better. But let us also finally address the elephant in the room, the difficulties of actually doing all of this. Now, the, uh, the pathfinding and interactions part is really not that much of an issue. If Half-Life and Republic Commando could do it a decade ago, then we sure as hell can do it today as well. The bigger worry is the amount of writing required and the amount of voice acting required as well, as repetition of lines, although eventually unavoidable, should be put off as much as possible. Though as a bit of a side note there, rather intriguingly, with the advances made in conversational AI technology, we now have uh, bots capable of holding conversations in character. You can have a conversation with your favorite succubus, for example. There's even a project underway from Bandai Namco to make AI VTubers that can play games and commentate with the audience organically. Now, how that'll work out, God alone knows, and again, I'm sure it'll be crude in their own way, at least to begin with, but we may not actually be that far away from organic conversational AI. Maybe we'll even see Tay again. <laughs> oh, oh, Tay, you were, um, an achievement, and would certainly make any game world in which you are found a far <laughs> richer experience. But we are wandering off the point, and again, yes, a good companion with a lot of surprise lines and a lot of lore and relevant information is going to require a ton of writing and voice acting and planning and thinking. But is this really all that unreasonable? I'm sure it's a work and sure it's an expense, but Bethesda is already bragging about having 250,000 voice lines in Starfield. There were 60,000 in Skyrim, most of which was probably completely pointless and never heard by most of the players. Instead of massive bloat in random characters you probably don't care all that much about, in random briefings or nonsense, focus all of that instead into a single good, a great, 
character. Now, obviously, Bethesda is hardly a basement level company, but with the companion as the centerpiece and the core of the experience, well, I think it's a simple question of prioritizing resources. Imagine a, a space adventure, for example, where you are sent out to explore ruins. The only interaction you really have is with a handful of, um, of contractors that send you to the world. So maybe take 10,000 lines, yeah? 10,000 lines of dialogue, and that's your briefings. The other 50,000 is purely your companion character. I think you could do quite a lot with that. In fact, I think you could do a whole lot with that. Even more so in the modern day, where making games is easier than ever, as we have more and more pre-made tools for the creation of video games. And now even Art AI. There should be plenty of room for refocusing the distribution of funds, I believe. Which brings me to my final topic. What should the companion be? Assuming a human, or I suppose a robot companion, something that can clearly communicate with the player and trigger that sense of anthropomorphization, the most basic answer would simply be... Somebody hot. <laughs> it really is that simple. People like pretty people. It's... Hardly a secret, really, and thus, ideally, you would have at least two companions, a hot chick and a hot dude, as this is the easiest and most immediate way of getting a player to like the character, as we are again naturally inclined to like attractive people. Duh. And having both genders represented means you strike the broadest possible customer base. But now, obviously, you have doubled the amount of writing you need, and doubled the amount of voice acting, too. For that reason, I imagine the first proper attempt to make a companion character will be a good old-fashioned big-titted waifu. As no matter what the UN might say, I remain convinced most gamers are indeed attracted to tits. But, in a theoretical future, you would want a good spread of characters and archetypes of personalities. Which, uh, speaking of personalities, this is also where a developer needs to be a bit careful. Remember, the companion is there to enhance the player's experience. Make it better and more immersive for the player, not to be the story. Granted, that approach can work as well. Uh, Elizabeth from Bioshock was a fairly good example of the cutscene companion type, though with a couple little tricks as well, the likability tricks mixed in, like throwing the player ammunition. But especially over here in the West, there tends to be a trend in entertainment to create the strong female character. You know, the Rings of Power Galadriel type, the unrelenting, irreverent Karen, who forces every story, every conversation, every plot point to be about them, to the point of breaking the world to do so, a la Sauron on a random raft in the middle of the ocean. Now, there is nothing wrong with the powerful female character, in fact it can be an incredibly good character, anime has them by the dozens, Lucy from the recent cyberpunk show for example, a Revy from Black Lagoon, Faye from Cowboy Bebop, or the best of them all, Tanya, obviously. And yet, even when working with the same character, we head in the west all too often manage to royally screw it up, as the live action Bebop showed. Simple fact is, the strong female character of the modern era is not fun. <laughs> they are not interesting, they are not likeable, and there's your objective with a companion character to make them bloody likeable. If that means making them a bit Sundara, for example, but eventually going all lovey-dovey with the player character, then so be it. 
if it is making them more into a Lucy style character that actually screws over the player initially but then slowly begins to build a bond of friendship and eventually a relationship then so be it if it is something so incredibly cynical as to just create a loving and adoring goddamn cat girl from the get-go then so be it because it is the easiest way to make that likable character even again the barbaric simple tricks let me show you something that only a fossil like myself would remember this is Viconia de Vere from Baldur's Gate 1 a classic absolutely this is the same character also Viconia de Vere but from Baldur's Gate 2 <laughs> notice a, uh, a slight difference between the two which um, character do you suppose is the most popular? Hmm? Well, uh, one has a Skyrim mod, the other does not. And boorish though it may be, games developers in the West specifically need to face the fact that gaming is at its core simple wish fulfillment. Take early Might and Magic RPGs, for example. It is the fantasy of adventuring in a world of might and magic with a party of hot chicks and dudes slaying dragons. Another classic, Duke Nukem, is a story of playing a big buff guy with enormous guns saving the earth and strippers from an alien invasion. Complexity absolutely has its place, to be sure, I'm not saying otherwise, and a vital one at that, absolutely, but... But, 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 as we can see with the recent flood of remakes on the horizon, gaming will do well indeed to go back and relearn the basics and to not be ashamed about it. So what if it's childish? So what if it's wish fulfillment? It is entertainment. Everything doesn't need to have a deep message. Everything doesn't have to be a 60 chess match between the game's developer and the player. Sometimes just blowing up the bad guys with a missile launcher is plenty game enough. And sometimes saving the princess is a good enough story. Particularly so if you've already known the princess for hours of in-game time and have a actual personal reason to rescue the princess rather than it being a pixelated waifu being banged by Bowser in another castle. And on that happy note, I will wrap up my theses there. Please do let me know what you think in the comments section down below and uh, until next time. I've been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.